This evening, the subject is entitled, The Seven Pillars of the Christian Church. Some years ago, in one of the large eastern cities, a father and three of his children were trapped on the fourth story, and there was a terrible fire. They ran to the staircases, and they were just full of smoke. Fire, the blazes were coming up the steps. It seemed as if they were to burn, be burned alive. The father happened to go to the window, and he looked, and he saw in the apartment just across from them, they had left their window open. It was only about three feet apart, and he called his children together, and he said, Listen, Daddy's going to try and stretch over there and catch that window sill. I'm going to hold myself as rigid as I can and come quickly as you can because it's going to be a terrible strain. But I want you to go over there and we'll be safe. The older child who was seven crossed over first. Then the five-year-old, the little baby was a little slow, the three-year-old, because he didn't know. But dad knew he better put the heavy weight first. So he helped him and urged him to come on. The other boys helped him across. And as the dad was trying to strengthen himself to crawl up in there himself, his hand slipped. He fell to the pavement below and was picked up dead. Friends, Jesus Christ made a bridge of salvation for you and for me by giving his life for the children of men. Do you know, brother, sister, the Bible makes it very plain that the plan of salvation is placed upon seven pillars. Seven denotes completeness or perfection. The seven last plagues, the seven seals. Oh, the seven is a complete perfect number in the word of God. And God has made it so vividly and so beautifully illustrated the plan of salvation and what he did for your salvation and mine. After man had sinned, there was no hope unless there was a Savior. But did you know that God foreordained and he saw ahead that if somebody should sin, that Jesus would die for them? Did you know that? You've never read that in the Bible, have you? Well, I had better give you some Bible on that. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Well, it was made manifest in these last times for you. Hey, that's a whale of a passage, isn't it? You folks didn't think it will come through on that one, did you? You said he's out here on a limb tonight. But don't you worry, God has an answer for these things. So God wasn't caught without a plan. And in case man should die, he promised beforehand that he would give him eternal life if he would accept Christ. You want Bible for that, don't you? It says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. See, that's another whale of a text, isn't it? So remember, God wasn't caught off guard. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. Now, maybe I better take that last one is Acts 15, 18. The other one was Titus 1, verse 2, and the other one was uh, 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20. Now you've caught up with me. I just gave him in reverse. Do you have it now? Listen. In order to save you and me, Jesus Christ had to become man. Only a God-man could save you and me. And in theology, what do we call that? Incarnation. We mean Jesus Christ entering into human flesh. So when you hear people talking about the incarnation, we're talking about God becoming man, a God-man, the only type of birth, the only birth of this type that has ever existed in this world. And we read over in the book of Matthew, the first chapter, verses 18 to 25, these words. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, 
was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is, you tell me, God with us. Then Joseph, being raised out of sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not until when. You've got the point. And he called his name Jesus. I want you to know that Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was a God-man. And in fact, 1 Timothy 3.16, it talks about this mystery. Friends, I don't understand, I must confess, how this could happen. It's a mystery to me. But a lot of things I accept, I don't fully understand. I drive a car right at night, go in many dangerous places. I don't know how that car operates. There are people who do know, but I go by faith. Am I making it clear? I don't know how a brown cow can eat green grass and have white milk and you turn it and it turns to yellow butter. But we accept it, don't we? I don't fully understand the incarnation but God said in 1 Timothy 3.16, and without controversy, this is something over which we don't have any argument about because we don't know enough to argue about it. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. And friends, this is giving it in a nutshell about what Jesus did. Isn't it marvelous? You and I have to be justified, but Jesus didn't need to be justified. He never committed any sin. Friends, follow me carefully. Well, I could give you many verses to verify this. You know, John in St. John 1, 1 to 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was what? The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now notice your 14th verse. I mean, St. John 1 to 3, then verse 14. And the word, now you told me the word was God. Isn't that what you told me? And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So in order to save you and me, someone who could identify himself with man had to come here on man's equal and man's level, endure his temptation, so he'd know how to help you and me when we get in trouble. Otherwise, you say, well, he's God. He doesn't understand what we're going through. I'm human. He's divine. But friends, Jesus Christ veiled his humanity in such a marvelous way that he could walk and talk with men, and they were not struck dead. But he was a God-man. That's why he calls himself the Son of Man. He is the God-man. Listen, there's a popular teaching today going around that when Jesus was born, that he didn't take the nature of fallen sinful nature, but he took the nature that Adam had before he sinned. Lend me your ears. Nothing could be further from the truth. Did you hear what I said? Nothing could be further from the truth. I want you to get your Bibles out. We're going to read this. I want you to turn to Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 3 and 4. Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. And you're going to hear this and say, hey, I'm not just talking about laymen talking this kind of talk. I'm talking about preachers are talking this. And no man who has studied the word of God could come out with such a philosophy. Do you have it? 
Notice what it says here in Romans 8, verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. Now, friends, don't misunderstand that verse. Wasn't anything wrong with God's law. But because of the weakness of the flesh, the fleshly man can't obey God's law. Is that understandable? You know, you can take a tree that's strong and take a good, strong, sharp axe and ask spears to fell that tree. I can't do it because I'm weak in the flesh. If I try and take a axe and start chopping down that tree, I'd fall down if I used both hands, and it would take me a long time doing it with one hand and holding on. You understand the point? Nothing wrong with God's law, but because of the weakness of the flesh, they were unable to obey that law. Notice what it says. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of Adam's nature. Oh, oh, oh. Let, let me try that again. What kind of flesh? What kind? Now, whom shall I believe? Some learned man that has come up like this. Well, Dr. So-and-so said this. And maybe we believe everything he says because he has a degree in his field. Forget it, friends. Take God's word. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the world. Condemned sin in the flesh. In other words, he conquered sin in the flesh that the righteousness, the right doing of the law might be fulfilled by us. What, what did you say? We can't do it, brother, sister. Not by us, but in us. The Holy Spirit has to be in our lives and enable us to live in harmony with that holy law. For what the law could not do in that it was weak to the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemns sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So God says, I'll put my Spirit in you, I'll give you power to live in harmony with that law. But before I do that, I'm going to send my Son down in the likeness of sinful flesh, and He's going to live that life perfectly. No one can say He's done any harm or committed any sin. What a wonderful plan God has for you and me. I could give you many more, but it's Sunday evening, and I'm going to let you out a little early. At least I hope to. Now, that was only one passage I gave you. I could give you several of them if you wanted to prove. But you can understand this, friends. If Jesus Christ had not come and identified himself with mankind, we would say, well, sure, he could do it. He was God. But he didn't use his divinity during his temptation. Now, secondly, the second pillar in this bridge of salvation is called sinless life. What did I call it? Sinless life. Jesus Christ never committed any sin. Did you know he made a challenge one time in St. John 8.46? He said, which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? How many believe Jesus Christ never committed any sin? Hold up your hand. Now, how many can give me some Bible that he didn't? That's what you want, isn't it? You want Bible proof that he didn't. And how many witnesses do we need? We only need two, don't we? And spiritism stingy, is he? He's going to give you three, isn't he? All right. You ready for it, are you? First John 3, verses 4 and 5. Do you have it? Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. What's the rest of that? And what? And in him, isn't that beautiful? Whosoever, that means 
it's all inclusive. Anybody who does any kind of sinning is sinning against God's law. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is, not was or has been, is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. That's what John said under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Peter says in 1 Peter, the second chapter, verses 21 and 22, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin? Neither was guile found in his mouth. No deceit in his mouth. So that's two witnesses, isn't it? We've got a sure foundation on which to build for eternal life. Jesus was sinless. Then in Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16, and I use the 14th verse, so you know, about the, the, the individual of whom the scripture is speaking. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heaven. For we have not what? High priest. Hard to glad he's your high priest. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That's three witnesses, isn't it? You've got John, you've got Peter, and you've got Paul. And then he bids us, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So we can come to the Lord Jesus Christ with holy boldness, knowing that he understood sin, he was victorious, victorious over every sin, and he can give you and me power that we can live over sin, above sin. You know, this is why we're told over in Second Peter, the first chapter and the fourth verse, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. As Jesus Christ overcame sin in the flesh, holding on to God's promises, being filled with his Holy Spirit, you and I can live the victorious life. What a wonderful promise, brother, sister. These are precious promises. Exceeding great and precious promises, God calls them. Aren't they wonderful? And then Jude 24 and 5 now unto him that is able to keep you from what? And to present you faultless. That means without fault. And to present you faultless. Did you get that before whom? Presence of his glory. So you're in God's presence. God sees how you're living. He knows whether you're going to live the life or not. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Marvelous what he can do for us. But somebody says, Spears, if Jesus Christ came here and was born as a Savior, why then did he have to die? Why? Well, I'll give you the three reasons from the Word of God. In 1 John 3, 4 we read, Whosoever committeth sin, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, which law is he talking about? The transgression of which is sin. Where is that found in the Bible that is the Ten Commandments when he's talked about whosoever committeth sin, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Where is that in the Bible? Now, if I hadn't given you this, I wouldn't be so hard on you. But I've given you this before, and I'm not a very good teacher. Either I didn't make it plain, but I'm going to make it plain again. I want you to know that the Bible is clear on this. I'm reading from Romans 7, 7. This is how those places. And the Holy Spirit will help you when you begin studying the Word. You have it? What shall we say then? 
Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now what law says thou shalt not covet? That's right, that is the Tenth Commandment of the Decalogue, isn't it? Yes, friends. I'm glad you're with me now. So, the law of God had been broken, and it's talking about the Ten Commandments. And whenever any sin a man commits, he's violating one of those commandments. You can trace any sin back to that. Let me tell you something, brother, sister. And Romans 6.23 tells you why Jesus had to come and die. I'm, I'm opening this up from the Scriptures. Since, because you know the Bible says that he shall save his people from their sins. And the word Jesus means Savior. So if he was a Savior when he was born, why did he have to die? Pretty good question, all right. But here's the reason. For the wages of sin is what? Now, the law of God demands the life of the violator of the Ten Commandments. Whenever a man breaks the law of God, either he has to die or someone had to be his substitute. You and I would have died, but Jesus Christ, even Adam and Eve would have died. But God had a plan, and he had the promise, and I will make enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. This plan, and that he was going to die for human beings. Adam and Eve would have died there instantaneously. But God had a plan. So as a result, they had an opportunity to repent of their sins and make peace with God. But follow me carefully, friends. Jesus died in your stead to keep you from dying. So the wages of sin is death. And the Bible says that the blood has to come from some place. When a man dies, blood has to be shed. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, let me make it a little clear. When we talk about Jesus Christ shedding his blood, we really mean that Jesus Christ is giving his life. Am I making that clear? For in Leviticus 17, verse 11, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So blood, our life, Jesus gave for you and for me. And that's why, though he came here as a Savior, he had to die, or we would have had to die. As John calls it, he is the propitiation. He is our atoning sacrifice. That's what that means. Am I making it plain? Well, what shall I more say? Then, after Jesus Christ lived a sinless life, he had to die. So you put on a crucifixion. You have it? Crucifixion. Was Christ crucified? Where? Some people will tell you he was crucified on a Wednesday, was he? I just want to be sure you know. Paul said, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Galatians 6.14 Friends, Jesus Christ died upon the cross. For you, for you, and for me. But you know, for every truth in God's word, the devil has a counterfeit. You didn't hear what I said. The devil has a counterfeit. Do you know once a year, there is a special occasion set aside, practically by all churches, to commemorate his crucifixion or his death. Can you tell me when that is? When? No, that doesn't come commemorate his death, does it, dear folk? Well, that's the, what did you say? Is it said loudly? Good Friday. Good Friday. Yes, yes. Now, let me ask you, wonder where the preachers are getting this Good Friday business from. And you know they go to church from 12 and to 3? Don't you know that Jesus Christ hung on the cross six hours, not three? You want Bible for that, don't you? All right, turn to Mark 15, 25. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. That was 9 o'clock in the morning. You see, the Jews counted time differently than we do. 
whether it was day or night, the first hour started with six, so the first hour would be seven, the second eight, the third hour would be nine o'clock, and so on. Is that understandable? Follow me now. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Verse 33, and when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, what about it? What did he say? Eloi, Eloi, let me say back the night, which, and gave up the ghost on verse 37. Now let me help you here, friends. Did you get, it was the ninth hour, then we got the sixth, I mean the third hour, then the sixth hour, then the ninth hour, did you get that? How many hours were you hanging there on the cross? Six hours, not three. And friends, do you know, you say, oh, spirits, you're getting a little picky now. Do you know what the Great Commission was? Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Matthew 28, 19 and 20 I'm reading. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe anything your church preaches. Oh, well, let me try it again. Teaching them to observe whatsoever the preachers say. All things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So the church of the living God is to teach and preach only what God has commanded. Well, spirits, don't you think his death on the cross was important. Well, what's wrong about celebrating Good Friday? Well, there's may have a lot of figures and things. Well, we're doing it for this and we're doing it. But God didn't let it go by unnoticed. We have to do it the Jesus way. Now you turn to the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verses 23 to 26 inclusive, and we'll find out that God didn't overlook this, and he's told us what to do. You know, all the Lord asked, and he says in Luke 6, 46, and why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Well, do what God asks you to do, not what somebody else is telling you to do. Do you have it? That which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. What does that say? What? This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye do what? And drink this cup. You do show that I died on Good Friday. <laughs> what does that say? For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Is that understandable? So the Lord's Supper is a memorial of the crucifixion of Christ and not Good Friday. No wonder God says in Colossians 2.8, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So we better be careful what we're doing. Am I making it plain? Well, what shall I more say? But after Jesus Christ died, he had to rise. Otherwise, you couldn't be saved. And if Christ be not raised, then is your faith vain, and you are dead in your sins. Did you know that? 1 Corinthians 15, 17. Was Jesus Christ resurrected? Could you give me a Bible verse that says it? You know, it reminds me of a minister preaching over in India, eastern India. And after he got through presenting his message... A Muslim who was a follower of Muhammad came up and he said, you know, we've got something better in our religion than you do, than you folk have who call yourself Protestants and follower of the Christ, the Messiah. 
The minister said, well, please tell me, what is that? He said, well, now, you know, when we go to our holy city, Mecca, we find the tomb of Muhammad there. And, you know, of course, Muhammad was the Arabian prophet. But they say, when we go there, we find his tomb, we find his coffin. When you folk go to your sacred city, Jerusalem, you don't find anything. His coffin isn't there. And the man said, yes, that's just the difference. We serve a living Christ, and you serve a dead one. <laughs> Revelation 1.18. These are the words of Jesus. Do you have it? I am he that liveth and was dead. I died, yes, and was dead. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Yes, your Savior, my Savior, was resurrected. He holds the keys. He holds the keys to the grave. That's hell, you see. Hades. And he holds the keys to death. Thank God he's going to destroy death. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. First Corinthians fifteen twenty six. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So he's going to even burn up the graves. That's going to go in the fire too. Am I making it plain? And he's going to call Muhammad and everybody else who's in the grave. Yes, he was resurrected, friends. The resurrection of Christ, one of the pillars. You've got the incarnation, sinless life, crucifixion, now resurrection. No wonder Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. St. John eleven twenty five. Yes, friends, he is the life giver, isn't he? And when he speaks, we're going to live. But you know, friends, there's a whole lot of tradition around his resurrection. Where do you find in the Bible that we're to celebrate Easter in honor of his resurrection? Where does it say anything about Easter Sunday being the time that the church should celebrate his resurrection? There's no place in the Bible that says this, my dear friends. And yet the whole world takes Easter. And by the way, this is Aostri from the old Anglo-Saxon moon goddess. You see... Satan is so clever, thousands of years before Jesus Christ ever came to this earth, people worshipped the sun and the moon. And of course, when Jesus Christ was risen about the time of the celebration of the moon, they said, well, now, why not call this in honor of his resurrection? And Constantine, who was the emperor who was supposed to have been converted, brought in many of these pagan customs into the church, and they're still in the church tonight. Am I making it plain? Do you know what, friends? The word Easter is found one time in the Bible, but by mistranslation. It comes from the Greek word Pascha, which means Passover. See, when Nimrod and Semiramis were leaders of Babylon, when he died, she said his spirit would go to the sun. And when she died... She, her spirit would go to the moon. Well, he died, and after his death, she was found with child. And she called the child Tammuz. And of course, one day when he was a young man, he was attacked by a wild animal and was killed. Long before Jesus Christ ever came to this earth, people were weeping 40 days before the celebration of the moon or Easter. Am I making it plain? Now, in different countries, in different nations, under different names. Ishtar, or, or Ostaroth, all of these were the same name for that same moon goddess. Am I making it plain? Call the goddess of fertility. But what I can't understand, brother, sister, is what does the bunny rabbit... The Easter egg, the hot cross buns, and the early sunrising worship have to do with the resurrection of Jesus. 
Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Do you know all of this was nothing else but paganism and it's been brought into the Christian church? Let me make it plain to you, friends. Seest thou not what they do in the cities of Judah and in Jerusalem? The children gather wood and the fathers kindle a fire and the women need their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. Did you, did, did, would you, I better let you read that. I bet that's marvelous, friend. When Israel apostatized, this is exactly what they did. Jeremiah 7, 17 and 18. Sith, thou oh, not what they do in the cities of Jerusalem and in the streets of Jerusalem. The children gather wood and the fathers kindle fire. And the women need their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven. Did you get that? To whom? And the queen of heaven was a moon goddess. What's the rest of your verse? And to pour out drinkings unto whom? Unto other gods. And what did it do about the heavenly father? What did he think about it? It provoked him to anger, didn't it? Am I making it plain? Now, remember, God doesn't want the false and the true combined. Did you hear what I said? And when we follow these pagan customs and these pagan customs in the church, God is displeased. He said therefore to me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me to the door of the house of the Lord which was toward the north and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Ezekiel 8 verses 13 and 14. You see, back there in those days when Israel had apostatized, they were doing the same thing that the heathen was doing. And the ladies cut off their hair and presented them in locks and braids to Tammuz, who was killed by this wild animal. And they wept, and many, many abominable things went on during those 40 days of weeping for Tammuz. Am I making it plain? You don't believe it, you read your history about it. This is your 40 days of Lent that you have before celebrating Easter, and you don't know it. Am I making it plain? Then, friends, let me go a little further. Let me go a little further. Do you know when, Jesus, when Mary Magdalene went to the sepulcher, and do you know when Jesus was risen? Do you think it was at sunrise? Neverly. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark. And to the sepulchre and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. St. John 20 verse 1. I want you to read that. I, I want to just show you how we're just following custom and not Bible. You have it? St. John 20 verse 1. Let's read it together. The first day of the week come up Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark. I couldn't hardly hear you, but it's all right. I suppose you read it all right. But let me tell you something, friends. This was dark, and the stone had already been rolled away. Jesus was risen. Am I making it plain? Why, then, do we have these Easter sunrise services? You're following the old pagan custom. Then said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the temple, at the door of the temple of the Lord, there were twenty and five men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east. They did this back there in Ezekiel's time, worshiping the sun, and friends were carrying it on today, saying, well, we're going to have an early sunrise. We're honoring the resurrection of Jesus. They were doing this back there, honoring Samirimus, the moon goddess, back in Babylon. Am I making it plain? This is the carryover you get. And of course you have the rabbit, and, and whether you know this or not, the moon goddess was known as being the goddess of fertility, and that's why you have your bunny rabbit and your eggs, symbols of fertility. Am I making it plain? 
And if you'd go to your library and read up on some of this, you'd see all the wickedness and all the fornication was going along with all of this celebration with paganism. We brought that into the church and we think, Happy Easter! <laughs> well, what shall I more say? You want truth, don't you? I read lastly from Ezekiel 8, verses 15 and 16, where they're worshiping the sun. And you see, friends, when God erected his tabernacle, he always had it facing the east, so his people would have their backs to the sun, not, and the heathen worshiper would always want his face to the sun. But this was an abomination, shamefully vile in God's sight when they did it. Am I making it plain? And do you know, friends, the hot cross buns you get on Good Friday? That came from making these cakes to the Queen of Heaven that you read over there in Jeremiah 7, 18. Am I making it plain? Well, what shall I more say? It's astounding how far we've gone making substitute. But you say, well, Spears, doesn't the Bible want us to remember his resurrection? Sure, but not by eating. Not by putting on a new hat and a new coat and a new suit. That isn't God's plan. That's the devil's plan. Now what is God's plan? Do you have your Bibles? Turn to Romans 6. The 6th chapter of Romans. Verses 3 to 6. Romans 6 verses 3 to 6. He didn't let his resurrection go by unnoticed. But we're to do it his way. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Do you have it? Let's read it. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of, you tell me. Read on. Knowing this, that the you, the old man is what? The old man is crucified. Just like he died on the cross, you crucified the old man. Read on. Might be destroyed, that henceforth, we should not serve sin. He has given us baptism to represent his death, burial, and resurrection, and the new birth. When you and I are born again, when you go down in that water, you go down burying the old man with sin. You rise to walk a new life with Christ, and that's the way he wants you and me to celebrate his resurrection, by our new life, living in honor of him. Not new clothes, not new hats, not new shoes. Easter is the greatest trade on earth. But God wants you and me to remember that baptism is the memorial that he gave us, not the first day of the week or Easter Sunday. And by the way, did you know there is no Bible authority for Sunday? Am I shocking you? I say there is no Bible authority for Sunday. Now, you might go to your minister and say, can you show me in the Bible where it tells us that we're to honor the first day of the week and honor the resurrection? Ask him for the verse and chapter, but don't you hold your breath. Now, I'm going to give you something from Mr. Webster's dictionary. Come on up here, brother. I want you to come up here with me. It's all right, yes. We're going to read this together, what Mr. Webster says. All right. Mr. Webster says... Now, now wait a minute. I want you to tell him where... Lip over that and tell him what, what this... What year was that? Oh, yeah, that tells you. 1958. And this what is, is out it? of the Consolidated Webster Encyclopedic Dictionary. All right. Let's read it together. Sunday. Sunday. The, the first, first day, day of the week. week. In, In ancient, ancient times, it, it was the day on, on which the sun was worshipped. In the early days of the church, church Christians, Christians began to observe the first day of the week in honor of the resurrection, in addition to keeping the seventh-day Sabbath of the Decalogue. Let me stop right there. The word Decalogue comes from the Greek word deca, which means the Ten Commandments. Am I making it plain? Let's read on now. 
Gradually, the seventh-day Sabbath was abandoned and the first day adopted, though without any biblical authority as the Christian rest day. Did you get what Mr. Webster said? He said they changed it, but without any biblical or without any Bible authority. The first Sunday law was that of Constantine the Great, A.D. 321. Now, I wouldn't tell you this. I want Mr. Webster to tell you, because you've got two witnesses. He said it, and I said it. So it's established. I'm making it plain. Listen, friends of mine. God, in his infinite love, has given us baptism to commemorate his resurrection and the new birth that we can live that new life since we buried the old man of sin. We rise to walk a new life, and this is what he wants, a new life to honor his resurrection. Now, do you know some people don't want truth? But you ought to thank God for this truth, because I know you haven't heard it in your churches before. So you ought to thank God that a man's got enough boldness to buck the whole world and tell just what it is and where it's coming from. But I'm not through. After Jesus Christ was resurrected, he must ascend. And you remember Jesus was reading, walking along there in the book of Acts, verses 8 through 11. It says, but ye shall receive, this is the last time the disciples were with him and talking with him. He said, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stands he looking up where? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into where? Shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now follow me carefully. You remember one night I gave you how Jesus Christ was escorted with those angels and how one, when they got near the, to the gates of God, they cried out, Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Psalms 27, I mean Psalms 24, verses 7 to 10. You've read that, haven't you? If not, read it. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lift up the everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. And of course, the 12 angels who guard the gates said, who is this king of glory? They know who he is, but they love to have his name praised. And as they get to the city of God, and before they get to the opening of the gates, they cry out again, lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts! He is the king of glory. That's what the escorting angels cry back. You understand the point? Then, friends, Jesus was enthroned by the innumerable company of angels. After that ceremony, Jesus was glorified. Now, I don't know whether you ever understood this or not, so I'm going to bring this out with the ascension, because this is what happened. If Jesus Christ had not ascended, you and I, his death on the cross, would be meaningless if we only died for our sins and didn't give us some way to have power over sin. Now, I'm reading from St. John 7, 37 to 39. St. John 7, 37 to 39. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Why? Because the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus was glorified when he started his ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. And that was his inauguration. And then, friends, he sent his ambassador, his vicar, and a vicar is a substitute. The Holy Spirit is the vicar of the Son of God, and he sent him on that day of Pentecost. 
the day that Jesus began his public ministry, I mean his heavenly ministry, in the heavenly sanctuary, he sent his Holy Spirit down. And you remember it says, and when the day of Pentecost will come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with what? They were all filled with what? And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Some night I'm going to talk on, will all true Christians speak in tongues? But be that as it may, this was the beginning of the work of the Holy Spirit, who is the representative of Jesus Christ on this earth. And he's still here directing and going on. And if you'll let the Spirit of God, he'll guide you into all truth. He'll guide you into all this book. And I'll tell you again, friends, those gates are going to sway, swing open, open again. They are going to swing open again. I read in Isaiah 26, verse 2, Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Is that what it says? No. It says, Open ye the gates. See, the other time it said, Lift them up. This time, Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. So who is going to get in there? Those that are keeping the truth. What is truth? Would you like a Bible definition for it? John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Psalms 119, verse 142. Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. You can't break this law. You have to obey it if you expect to get in there. Revelation 22, 14 says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So if you want to get into those gates and you want them to open again for you and me, we've got to be obedient to the commandments of God. I thought I'd just drop this little bit in on the ascension because it was at Christ's ascension after he had that celebration was over. He started his work as your mediator, your advocate, and your savior. Am I making it plain? So that was an important pillar, the ascension. The crucifixion wouldn't mean a thing if God didn't give you and me the spirit to overcome and to resist sin. Do you hear what I said? Just dying for your sins wouldn't help. You've got to have power over your sins. You can't always be, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. You can make Lord, thank you for helping me overcome my sin. We've got to thank him for the victory he gives us. And victory is a gift, just like forgiveness is a gift. You can't do it on your own. All God wants is you to surrender yourself to him. And the world is yet to see what God can do with and for and through and in a man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. But friends, after his ascension, the sixth pillar is mediation. You know, Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God, and you and I couldn't get a prayer through if we didn't ask it in his name. Did you know that? You want Bible for it? St. John 14, 13 and 14. Jesus said, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, in whose name? In my name, what did he promise? Did you get that? And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's why when we pray, we say these blessings or these favors, we ask in the name of Jesus. He told us to do that. Am I making it plain? Then, friends, the Bible says, for there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. First Timothy 2.5. You see, a mediator is a peacemaker. Sin has caused man to be estranged. There is a problem. There's variance between God and man. Is, that, is this understandable? And Jesus Christ is the peacemaker. He came and he, when you and I pray, friends, we get our prayers through because we're asking in, in his name. Another scripture is good. It's 1 John 2, 1 and 2. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. My little children, 
These things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. He's an atoning sacrifice for the whole world. Now listen, this word advocate and comforter is from the same Greek word. Did you hear what I said? Same word. So here, when Jesus said that he is going to be our advocate, and I want you to get this word. When you take off, an advocate means an added voice. Advocate means an added voice. When you and I pray, Jesus takes those voices and goes, well, takes our what we're saying, and he goes with us and pleads for the Father. Father, they've accepted me. I shed my blood. They are sorry for their sins, and God hears and forgives. So an advocate is one who intercedes. Not only in the ancient gospel did they write out the things that the client was supposed to see, and an advocate is the word that we call a paraclete. Para means along with client, or cleat, they call it, or along with the client. So Jesus is our advocate going along, and we are the clients. We're the ones that have to stand before the judgment. Jesus knows the judge. He knows, I should say, the presiding judge. He knows the 24 jurors. He knows the court. He knows the law, for he's the lawgiver. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our king. The Lord is our savior. Aren't you glad? Yes, he can save us. He knows all about it. So he can certainly rightly represent you and me before the heavenly throne. God is counting on you and me to live the life so we can meet him in the kingdom. But we've got one more pillar. Not only mediation. Not only does he mediate for us. He's coming again. The second coming of Christ is the seventh pillar. Without the coming of Christ, the plan of redemption is not complete. And did Jesus promise he would come? Do you believe he is coming? And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before his coming. 1 John 2.28. Now, I'm going to tell you about this. Some time ago in the Midwest, there was a young man who was a model Christian. Everybody spoke so highly of him. But he was secretly gambling. It was a shock to the little town when they found out this model Christian was caught in a raid and his name was written on the paper. He was embarrassed and ashamed and wouldn't come out of the house for weeks. This is what Jesus is saying to you and me. And now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, Get your Bible and look at that. You don't want to be ashamed either, do you? You don't want to be embarrassed, do you? Then live for God. There are some people doing things secretly. But God knows it. But be sure your sin will find you out. Before Jesus Christ comes, we must be ready. We can't get ready after he comes. We must get ready before he comes. And thank God you have every opportunity to do it. If you'll turn from your sins, confess and forsake them, Jesus will accept you, forgive you, and cleanse you. Let him do it tonight. He's speaking and calling. As the singing evangelist comes forward tonight and makes his appeal to your heart, I'm asking you, if you're here tonight and you haven't made peace with God, say, Lord, I'm glad you've established these pillars. I'm glad that you came in this world in human flesh for me. I'm glad you lived a sinless life for me. I'm glad that you rose from the dead. I'm glad that you ascended gloriously. I'm glad, Lord, that you plead effectively. And, Lord, I'm glad you're coming again triumphantly. I'm here tonight to surrender. As the singing evangelist makes an appeal to your heart for song. If you've never accepted him, just stand where you are. If there are those here tonight 
who have once known him and you've grown cold and you'd like to return, God is speaking to your heart. And if you're here tonight and you've heard truth that you've never heard before and you're willing by God's grace to obey him, whatever he commands, I'm willing to take God at his word. You kindly stand as the appeal is made in song. Listen, he's calling, he's speaking. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? Time after time, God has waited before, and now He is waiting again to see if you're willing. To open the door Oh, how he wants to come in Friends, we're not going to belong this service. If God has spoken to your heart, make that commitment tonight. He's speaking. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. And he with me. He's knocking. He's calling. Let him in. Give your heart. Give your life. Give up your sins and walk with him. This is the last appeal, the last song. This is your hour of opportunity. If you're here and you don't feel like standing and you intend to follow God all the way, just make a cross on the back of your card. And that will be your commitment, Lord. I'm willing to do all that you ask me to do from your holy word. And if there are those here tonight who need special prayer, just hold up your hand while this last stanza is being sung. Do you need prayer? Pray for me. I intend to obey God, but I need help. Listen. If you take one step towards the Savior, my friend, you find His arms open wide. Just receive Him. And all of your darkness will live within his arms you abide. Time after time. God has waited before And now He is waiting again To see if you are willing Oh, how he wants to come.
Amen. Thank you. Beautifully rendered. I'm asking the pastor if he'll come forward. Ask God's blessing upon the one who stood. For Jesus Christ would have left heaven for just one soul. Doubtless there are those who've made the cross and those of you who need special prayer. We thank Thee, our Father, tonight for this message that we have heard. Truly our hearts have been moved as we think of the great sacrifice of Jesus who gave his life for us. We thank you that he loved us with an everlasting love. We thank you, Lord, that he shed his blood so that we might have life eternal. And tonight, as we have contemplated what he has done, we feel so grateful. We're so thankful for all that Jesus has done for us. Many have raised their hands asking for prayer. They need you and we all need you, Lord. Yes. We've made crosses and we've recommitted our lives. And so we pray that thou will accept us and forgive us and cleanse us and give us grace and power and give us victory over sin. And as we walk with Jesus, holding his hands, we pray that we shall have the joy that only he can give as we live for him and love him. Now bless each one and continue to go with us step by step along life's journey. And we thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.